This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Check out the new YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Hi, I'm Nick Ravellis, the Geisel Director of Education and Outreach for San Diego Opera. As you know, we have a number of opportunities for you to get to know opera and our current season by tuning in here to UCSD-TV. One of our most exciting offerings is Stars in the Salon. This series is an opportunity for you, our audience, to meet the singers, the conductors, and the stage directors who create our productions. Taped before a live audience, the artists discuss their roles, the music, and the stories behind the operas. It's especially entertaining and informative for those of you who are new to opera. Join us now for Stars in the Salon, and I'll see you at the opera. Good evening, everybody. I'm Nick Ravellis, the Geisel Director of Education and Outreach for San Diego Opera. And this, of course, is our Stars in the Salon, Artists' Roundtable dedicated to the opera Moby Dick by composer Jake Heggie and librettist Gene Shear. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Russell and Mary Johnson, Producer Circle sponsors, for their generous gift toward the production of Moby Dick. And I know they're here somewhere. Where? So thank you very, very much for that. Um, We've got a lot to talk about. This is certainly one of the most exciting events that uh, we've had happen here, not only for San Diego Opera, but I think culturally uh, for the city of San Diego, our, our entire community, to have the opportunity to produce an opera that is only about two years old, not even quite that, um, and a brilliant opera at that. I, you're in for a real surprise if you have not seen it yet, if you didn't fly back to Dallas, uh, like I had the opportunity to do when it was premiered in April 2010. Uh, it's just a brilliant piece and brilliantly produced. And um, almost everybody here at this table is uh, doing the same role that they had in Dallas, including the stage director. Uh, there's, all, there's one new person, and we'll talk to him about that. But uh, let me introduce the entire panel, first of all, to my immediate right, uh, playing uh, what was her first pants role, at least at the time, in 2010, soprano Talese Trevine, playing the role of Pip the Cabin Boy. <laughs> and you remember Talese from uh, her wonderful Michaela last season. Uh, singing his debut with us in the role of Greenhorn is tenor Jonathan Boyd. <laughs> singing the role that he created, the, the, the main role really of this opera, the role of Captain Ahab, and making his debut with San Diego Opera at long last, Ben Hepner. <laughs> Next to him, of course, our brilliant music director and conductor of Moby Dick, Karen Keltner. And then, um, actually, one of the creators of, uh, of Moby Dick, working, he worked very, very closely with the composer and with the librettist from the very beginning of this project, our stage director, Leonard Folia. And next to Leonard, uh, the man who will play the role of the Pacific Islander harpooner, Queequeg, Jonathan Lamalu. <laughs> and uh, oh, by the way, all these folks making their debuts with us, and finally um, at the end of the table, um, portraying the role of uh, Starbuck, the first mate of the Pequod, uh, Morgan Smith, baritone. Now, I'd like to start because, unfortunately, we don't have the composer or the librettist here with us tonight. They will be here next week, 
uh, but schedules being what they are with two very, very busy artists, uh, we were not able to bring them in uh, early enough to be here for this event. So we can talk about them, which is always <laughs> a wonderful thing to do. But I would like to turn to uh, the stage director, Leonard Folia, first of all, and talk about a little bit about the origins of the opera uh, itself, the origins of the project, and how you came to fit into it from, from the very, very beginning, because it's my understanding that the three of you worked very closely from the beginning to put this project together. Right, I worked as the dramaturg um, <coughs> beginning three years before the premiere in, in Dallas. I had done that on Jake's previous opera, Three Decembers, when Gene Shear was also the librettist, and we had worked in that way. So I first worked as the dramaturg and just helped shape the arc of the story with the two of them, and then I, once it's completed, I took over the role as director. Now, what does that mean, shaping the arc? I mean, so it, was it like us, um, the writer of the story would be in a, no, or the writer of the book would be in a no, I, musical? I, I, or? I, I did not write this on any level. Gene Shear wrote it, and, and Jake Heggie, of course. It's, it's, um, it's to work with the librettist and discuss how to distill the book down into a dramatic form, because you're taking something from a literary form, mm -hmm. and you're trying to make it into something that has conflict and drama. And, and that's, that's the challenge. You know, how to, how to make it stage worthy. You know, very that, often you can take a story and just tell it exactly the way it's told in the book, and usually that doesn't work because the literary form is different from the dramatic form. In, indeed, and Moby Dick as, as a book is different from any book right. <laughs> ever written. And, and that's my next question. I think you, you're exactly the person then to stick with, and that is that um, the book, all 900 pages of it, has so many themes. Right. How did you determined that, that the opera, the theatrical experience, was going to focus on Ahab and his obsession. Was, that a, was there a journey to get there, or was that simple? Right. It, um, a decision was made before I was brought on board by Jake and Jean to set the entire opera at sea. Mm -hmm. And main part, there's a big part of the opera in terms of the, I mean, sorry, the book, in terms of the characters, Queequeg and, and Greenhorn in the book, a relationship that's established prior to the boat. And so by, by putting those limitations on it meant we, there was no way we could tell it in the same way that it's told in the book. So there are a lot of characters in the book. There are a lot of things that happen prior to getting on the boat. And so the first order of business was the decision on which characters we're going to be focused on and what the major relationships are. There are two sets of, the two major relationships are Ahab and Starbuck, Queequeg and Greenhorn. And those are the two relationships that we, we, major relationships that we follow the arc of them all the way through. If Gene was here, I would ask him the question, of course, uh, how much did he, how much dialogue did he take from the book and how much did he, did came well, directly from him? I hope I quote him correctly because he's been asked that a lot. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's about 40% from the book. Hmm. Because, and there are many dramatic scenes in the book. I, I imagine it was, uh, difficult to decide which dramatic scenes to hold on to and which ones to let go. Exactly, and he um, he's talked. To, what, what I have to just give Gene a compliment is that I think about forty percent of it is is from the actual book, and I don't think many people can really tell where Melville leaves yeah. and Gene Shield no, takes seamless. over. No, it's It really is. It's, he's done an extraordinary job. He was. He was someone that was so acquainted with every single moment in that book is when, when a decision was made to add, um, for instance, there's a, there's a beautiful aria near the end of the second act that was one of the latter things put into the show that Greenhorn has. And when we just started discussing what it should be, Gene came back two hours later with that text. Mm. He knew exactly the moment in, in Melville's book it needed to come from, and he was able to take Melville and and make it into a, a hybrid. Hmm. hybrid. And there's also the limitations of producers who say you can only have nine character, major characters. <laughs> 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 you know, so there, there, there is just the, you know, there's the practicality of it all. You know, so they knew going in how many principal characters they could have. Yeah. And so that made, that, you know, that focuses the decisions. Yeah. Uh, let's turn to Ahab. Uh, ben, this role was really created for you and written with your input. Could you tell us a little bit about the development 
of the character of Ahab as far as you were concerned when, well, once you I, came into the project? I have to say I, I don't know that I had as much input as uh, as one might think. I'd, I had, uh, well, Lenny was there and uh, uh, Jean and uh, Jake were in a New York apartment and we went through the, Jake took me through Act One because that's what it was finished at that point. And, um, you know, I just made some comments that I, that I thought perhaps there was too much emphasis on the high notes. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so he heard me and, uh, you know, rewrote it, and it, it works very, very well. Uh, but, of course, I told all my friends that I was doing the title role. Um, <laughs> but, but they, um, they didn't laugh. That was the horrible yeah. thing. <laughs> So uh, anyway, had a, I don't know, like I, I don't have that much of an input with with uh, all of that, but uh, uh, Gene and Jake and and uh, Lenny as well had really formulated er things really really well for for my voice and and other voices that sing in the same kind of dramatic range as I do. Mm -hmm. um, d you mentioned to me yesterday that the role. Uh, is is similar in terms of its challenges to Otello, which is a role that you sing. Mm -hmm. um, could you expound on that a little bit? It well, everybody knows the entrance of Otello in Act One, after that big sort of fight scene, and everything finally calms down, and he comes in. Esultate, l'orgoglio sepolto in mar, and. Uh, it's high and it's hard and everybody's waiting for it. Mm -hmm. Well, this has a harder entrance, I think, uh, because I start on a high A and stay there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I, maybe I won't give it all away, but uh, it's high A and it, you'll notice it. <laughs> uh, even though there's lots of chorus singing on stage. And uh, so maybe that's one of the similarities that one might feel. Um, it's very intense all the way through, uh, much like uh, Otello is. Um, and in a similar way uh, that Otello really only has one moment at the end of Act One, the, the love duet with, uh, with Desdemona, uh, there's only one real step back from the intensity of the uh, uh, pursuit of the whale and that obsession, and that's the Starbuck duet in, uh, closer to the end of the opera and where there's a bit of a step back and a reminiscence of what it might be like to be home and wouldn't that be nice? And Starbuck is, um, he may be a Quaker, but he's also a bit of a manipulator trying to get that to happen, probably just to save his own life. And uh, so uh, I guess in those ways and, and just the, the, the length of it, and the difficulty of it, it, it sort of stacks up well against Otello. Um, uh, Jonathan Lamalu. Queequeg, I think, is one of the most interesting characters in literature. It's certainly and one of the most interesting characters on stage in this particular opera. Um, he's a Pacific Islander, a so-called pagan and island royalty at that. He's a prince, is that right? Or a I believe so, king? yes. Um, um, you yourself are a Pacific Islander. Did, you, did that help you inform the character? <laughs> I thought you could say you yourself are a prince, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm a Pacific Islander, and um, I think the interesting thing, drawing back to what uh, uh, Lenny was saying about Gene and his ability to just literally find text that's so appropriate, I heard the story of uh, the chant that um, Queequeg sings, which is actually a, a Samoan chant or a Samoan declaration. And uh, apparently he was looking for some poetry for, for the, the role of Queequeg to sing. I think it was possibly a library, maybe in New York or something. And he found um, this particular text, which just happened to be uh, in the Samoan language. Mm. So the, the coincidence um, of me being a, a, a Samoan and a Pacific Islander as well um, was a lovely little story to actually be able to read the text and, and understand it or, or find a way of understanding it. So it's one of my favorite roles. I see it as a supporting role and kind of I'd like to think of it as all, almost a subplot to, of course, the obsession that Ahab has with the whale. Um, Greenhorn and I, uh, unlikely friends, um, become very, very firm companions during the journey. And I think that's a nice kind of um, balance to that, that kind of inner f fire that, um, that Ahab has and Starbuck actually trying to put that fire out. So, mm -hmm. yeah.
Jonathan, uh, this Jonathan, <laughs> um, uh, the role of, of Greenhorn, there's a wonderful arc, I think, in this relationship between you and Queequeg from the beginning of the show uh, to the end, and uh, a, a, a real blossoming, uh, a, a bonding between these two characters that's really quite wonderful and very human. It's just, it's lovely to watch. Um, um, what do you bring to that? I mean, how do you... Uh, see yourself as, as Greenhorn in that relationship, particularly? Well, it's interesting that uh, Greenhorn starts out uh, almost uh, naive in the sense of, uh, of what life is all about, and whereas Queequeg seems to be very solid on his ideas of what life is, you know, he's very calm, and we've even talked about this in rehearsals as well, that uh, he has a daily uh, plan that he's going to follow. Uh, he starts the morning out with a prayer every morning, and and uh, I think uh, Greenhorn is um, learns a lot about life through somebody who you wouldn't normally be a friend. Uh, you, first off, that you wouldn't really run into on the street of wherever mm. Greenhorn comes from. <laughs> uh, so it's you a, didn't you didn't read the book. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, but I, what, I guess what I'm saying is, is that Greenhorn's a little bit from, from, from everywhere. Yeah. Uh, Nantucket. <laughs> no. Uh, so I think Greenhorn starting off in the, the, the area of, I'm going to go out on this whaling boat. Why not? I've not, this is something I haven't tried, tried yet. And, um, if I'm out here, then I don't have to answer to anybody back there, uh, wherever back there is. So really, Greenhorn is truly, a, you know, someone that's ready to try anything. And he finds out that through Queequeg, wait, maybe there's something more to nothing. There, there should be something in everything. And I think that's where that develops throughout the, throughout the opera. Mm. Now, now, you're the newbie. Oh, in so many in, ways. <laughs> in, this, in this ensemble, and, and really because of uh, you know, creating a new piece, it, there's an excitement about that, and so many of your colleagues were involved in the world premiere. Um, I, I don't want to ask you if you feel left out, but, but I guess if, if... Well, since you've if, asked, if, if, no, I, if, I if don't reindeer, feel left out. If the reindeer are letting you play their reindeer games... Is, is they are definitely... In fact, this is, I mean, it's been a phenomenal cast in that sense. And yes, they got to uh, create it in Dallas, but they haven't uh, said, okay, jump aboard. <laughs> no pun intended, but <laughs> <laughs> I guess there is a pun intended there. But they have actually welcomed me aboard and worked with me to bring me to the level where they are so that when we're now in the rehearsal period here, we've been able to take it to the next level from where it's where it left off in Dallas as to where it's going now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's something that's been just really, uh, it's a phenomenal cast to, to do that. And I really have felt like part of the team. Must be exciting. Yeah. <laughs> See, yeah, we've gotten a lot of that in, in rehearsal. I mean, really, it's just, it's 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 really a team effort to do something like this because it really is such an ensemble piece. Even though each of us, each character has their own uh, path to follow in in the opera, uh, it takes all of us to follow that path. Yeah. Talise, um, now you, you have since played another pants role. But you, you didn't tell me what it was, though. What, what, what's the other pants? Because I don't really want that to get out. Oh, okay. Then I won't, I won't <laughs> no, ask. I still you. like my corsets and hoop skirts, too. Uh. Um, no, someone sent out a memo that Talise is only playing pant roles <laughs> this season. So I sang uh, Jamie uh, in New York at Caramore mm -hmm. with the, um, the ensemble there. It was exciting. Lots of high notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still. <laughs> and now your, your Pip, who is what? Uh, 14, 15 year old? 14 year old boy. Yeah, quite extraordinary. Um, I, I see him as quite brave, actually. How he even makes it to the Pequod in that time frame. Um, just, just getting to the ship alone is something quite miraculous. I mean, he doesn't have any ties. And, um, you know, his, his, he's right hand man to the man, mm -hmm. um, who's quite a famous. Sailor and uh, just just extraordinary. I see him as the heart of the ship. He's uh, the one boy that sort of binds 
everyone else, because I mean, everyone is there by way of somewhere else, and mm -hmm. and Pip is um, sort of the little pivotal character that links all of these different men and their and their experiences together. Um, and we've sort of I've been diving more into him this time around, and um, the idea of Pip being a seer or like a shaman, you know, mm. embodying something else. It's it's a lot deeper than even I, I knew the first time that I um, came out is has been really exciting to do here. I mean, I think that's the, just, you know, to touch on something that Jonathan had said, I think that's part of the magic of this cast, thanks to uh, Lenny and, and to Jean and, um, and to Patrick, who originally sort of set out on this journey, is that that isn't lost on any of us. I mean, we're you know, working with the best of the best here, and we're all in this room, always constantly searching for something else, never, never satisfied. And mm -hmm. that's, I think, what makes this so magical. Yeah. Yeah. Morgan, your relationship with Captain Ahab as his first mate, Starbuck, uh, is probably the, the, at least in my mind, the main conflict in terms of two people on that ship. Can you talk a little bit about that conflict and where, where these two characters butt heads? Well, it's really straight from the, from the start. Um, that conflict, I would say, in a way, really represents the engine of, of the story um, or of the plot, especially in, in the case of this opera. Um, Starbuck. In the operatic version of Moby Dick, there isn't a whole lot of backstory. Um, but I, I believe that Starbuck gets on this voyage. He's been, he's been on many other ships as well. Uh, doesn't particularly know Ahab well. Um, knows a little bit about him, but expects, uh, rightfully so, that I think this is just going to be another uh, money-earning voyage. And uh, from the get-go, Ahab basically declares his intention to, to do nothing but you know, to really focus on, on hunting down uh, Moby Dick. And that's alarming from, from the start for Starbuck because he's, he's an extremely morally grounded individual. He's uh, somebody who, who feels a very strong familial responsibility, somebody who in many ways has always has one foot on land. Um, in a way, through Starbuck, we, we remember that there is land uh, beyond beyond the ship, even though that it, it does the the entire opera does take place at sea, um, but we see that conflict from the start. It escalates in uh, in many pivotal and extremely um, satisfying scenes, especially um, getting to have arguments with uh, this guy. A few few people to my left here, Ben Hepner. That's extremely exhilarating and an honor to play with Ben. Um, but yeah, I think it's extremely important to the story and to the opera. Karen, let's talk about the music, which is just, uh, you know, if, if I can be a little um, editorial, it's just, a, it's a gorgeous score. Now that's saying, you know, that's sort of a general comment, but it's so lyrical. It's a but, wonderfully lyrical but piece. But also contemporary. It doesn't feel... It feels like nothing else. Yeah, that, yeah. That that we do or we have in the theater at this time in the opera theater. Um, I said to the cast the first day we met, and I, this was truly my, my, my honest feeling in Dallas, because I too was fortunate enough to go out there and watch uh, the final rehearsals and the opening. I was uh, amazed. There was never a moment that I felt that this, this ship and this journey was not taking place on the water and in a great surge forward most of the time. I mean, the music simply carries you away. The other thing that strikes me is that it is extremely accessible to the ear, um, extremely, as you say, lyrical. People can translate that as tuneful, which to many is a happy thing, I know. Um, interestingly enough, at the orchestra rehearsals, as people were leaving today, I heard people folks whistling motives already from <laughs> the orchestra musicians. You don't hear that very often, you know, kind of humming what's happening. But the piece is very accessible. It's highly, much more complex in its actual composition, much more sophisticated than 
it gives the appearance of being, I think, to the ear. It mm. is mm -hmm. very, very <laughs> difficult. It is a, um, an epic uh, collection of uh, rhythmic complexities, which if any of us loses focus for a second, we can be in a different meter than the one that's on the page. And that is not to say, uh, or to detract, at all from its, its wonderment, because it is truly a wonderment. But how he puts that together, how he, Jake Heggie, has, has put together what is on that score and make it, make it audible in the theater in the way it is audible and the way it carries an audience and the story, the journey along, to me is a miracle. I think the man is phenomenal, phenomenal composer and musician. And I applaud it, and we're, I'm throwing as many cues as I possibly can. <laughs> I, you know, Nick didn't say this, but I'm also a newbie. Uh, Jonathan and I are the newbies on this. The other folks have done this together. You've taken three other, two other journeys without that. <coughs> and now we're all coming together here, and um, it's a great pleasure a great challenge, and a truly epic journey. I mean this in the absolute best sense, but one of the things that's been sticking with me ever since I saw it is that the score really does a, have a kind of cinematic flow. Oh, yes. You know, that... Um, More than one person has come up to me at rehearsals, I mean, orchestral rehearsals, and said, this is like a wonderful movie score. Yeah. And I do not consider that at all a derogatory remark. I think something that's, it, it, is a, which is a wonderful score that carries you along with it has served and does serve its purpose very well. And I think, I think that's not a, an unfair or... Uh, well, I like to think back to the fact that uh, opera... It's music theater, informed, after all. ...informed film in a major way, sure. uh, and, and so many of the early Hollywood composers who were writing great scores were opera composers in Europe before they came over here. And I like to think of Moby Dick as a kind of payback in a sense that you know all of that has been learned by 21st century right. composers, um, I, and they're doing some really, I mean, I mean it, it, it just has that kind of well, the way Jake puts together, to the way, exactly, the way Jake puts together uh, instruments which give you this feeling of churning of water or forward motion, and Lenny talks about that a lot, and we, there's a distinct difference between singing something as a beautiful melody and singing something with a word that Len uses a lot and we all have in mind, intent. Mm -hmm. And it's not a necessarily a question of tempo or, or dynamic or color, but it is, a, it, it is a, a way of moving the score forward, which is, which is demanded by the score to make it breathe and live mm -hmm. the way it needs mm -hmm. to. I know that Jake has talked a lot about wanting to have a sense of the, that life goes on, the, the, the world keeps turning, the universe keeps going on, so it's even beyond the water and the motion. And one of the first things we talked about, and you'll see how, how it opens, is, is a sense of the universe and the inevitability of the universe that it's just, is that once this thing, story is done, this keeps going. It continues. This just keeps going. It's just one story. Other stories pop up and have their life, but it keeps going. So it's a sense of that, that, that churning and that sense of moving forward is, is the, what, what, the, what the world does every day, and we all know. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, and sometimes we wish it would just slow down a little bit, <laughs> or stop even, and let us rest. Um, three of you have some uh, uh, interesting challenges in the singing of your roles that I would like to um, talk about now. Uh, let's start with the challenge of makeup and Queequeg. You have quite a bit of body art to put on uh, before before the show starts. Uh, tell us a little bit about about that. Yeah, I'm, I, I believe in the Polynesian tradition, and um, even though a lot of these uh, tattoos aren't actually uh, traditionally Samoan, they they are brought together, in my view, from various. Uh, Polynesian places. So there's a full facial tattoo, um, chest, arms, back, um, and they all make um, various cameo appearances during the opera. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. Um, but I think it, it actually adds to the mystique of the character. And as I said, the, the, my contribution to the plot is in the, my relationship with Greenhorn. And um, I think something that Lenny said on the first day of rehearsals here, which I'd actually kind of forgotten about since Dallas, was just how unlikely a friendship uh, Greenhorn and Queequeg are. Um, and the fact that this flourishes throughout the piece into um, a, a real lifetime friendship um, is, is one of the beautiful moments of the piece, as, of the arc. So um, I very much enjoy the experience. I've just been in wigs and makeup today chatting about how exactly we're going to get these tattoos on and more importantly, how we get them off. <laughs> um, so we've had various permutations. I've, I wore most of mine in Adelaide just because I couldn't be bothered putting them back on again. So that makes for nice walks around town. Um, <laughs> how long does it take to apply them? Uh, I think in um, Dallas, they were done freehand by David Zimmerman and they took about an, uh, an hour and a half. It got more complex in Adelaide. And I used to have a three-hour call before op um, opening. So does, does that interrupt your, your schedule of warm-up and, and preparing yourself psychologically for the show? In some ways, maybe that is the, the warm-up. Hmm. I think as each, it sounds very artistic, but as each, <laughs> as each brush stroke is kind of, or each kind of shape is put on, your Jonathan changes into Queequeg, and so, um, you know, maybe that's my superhero costume, which I put on layer by layer, so that I become. Um, I Aces become don't have needed. to work that hard to warm up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so yeah, it's great. I mean, I have to shave my head as well, so I'm I am both looking forward and dreading that moment each time we put on the show. But but once again, that's the transformation, and yeah. in some ways, the physical transformation is the most important part of Quick Quick, as I said, because. He's a pretty scary looking guy, <laughs> um, particularly when a guy like Greenhorn, who is young and naive in many ways on the ship. Um, I think that's just the fun of it, seeing these two people become friends, because it, it's very unlikely in real life. Talese, you have a, an, an, an even stranger challenge. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about um, when you went to Dallas and discovered that you were going to have to sing a mad scene 30 feet in the air. It wasn't immediate. I remember for weeks just walking across a, a floor saying, just, just keep walking. It'll all make sense to you soon. Just <laughs> keep walking. And I'm, I'm, I have different theories about why it took so long for Lenny to tell me about the flying. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm a girl that welcomes challenges. and. Um, I actually didn't shy away from it at all. I actually got quite excited. So um, just being a boy you know, was alone was exciting <laughs> because I never get to do that. Um, and they have it made because the costumes are so much more comfortable than what we have to wear. Uh -huh. So it's a nice break from corsets <laughs> and you know, all those things. Um, but yeah, flying, um, it, it took some practice. Um, I have thighs of steel now. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's fun. I mean, I, I have a, a better background in dance, so that also, it, it kind of comes back a little easier than I thought it would, would do. Particularly today. Today was the first day I got back in the, in the saddle again. Mm -hmm. um, well, tell us, tell us why you're flying. Well, Pip drowns. He's, he's uh, thrown overboard and is uh, not, he doesn't, well, he does drown, but at this particular moment, he's lost at sea. And, um, it's the moment in which you see uh, Pip in the ocean. I still haven't really seen it. I've only seen one photo, which I think some of you have seen, which also, it's, actually, I don't want to see it. People often ask, well, what's that like? And I say, I don't know. <laughs> I'm singing. <laughs> um, but it, it's a wonderful effect. I mean, if, uh, a lot of the pictures, I mean, I'm looking at a program, now. even the, the men in the ship, the boats, it's, it's fascinating. Um, I think it's genius that, that you thought to put it up on a wire. I mean, it certainly is, um, it looks to be a beautiful effect. Oh Talese, tell them what the challenges or a challenge is when you wear the harness and sing, because we talked a little bit about, yeah. No one would think of this, <laughs> no. I mean, um, well, the harness itself, which 
you know, is it's no one ever sees, but it's like a little backpack. So you get into it, and basically both legs and arms are 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 strapped down and tied as locked down as tightly as possible. Um, and the only bit of uh, I'm sitting on an X, basically suspended in the air by a wire, and you have to seems so unladylike to do it now, but I literally have to arch my back. So I'm sort of in a backward C. It doesn't look like it, which another thing is another thing, like you never really know how hard <laughs> someone's working because it looks really beautiful, but I'm sort of in a backward C, and then the legs have to move in different directions so that I don't continue to oscillate while traveling across the stage and breathe and sing. <laughs> So. Yeah, where does your support come from? I don't know. <laughs> anyway. From terror. <laughs> Fear. I think the first time we did it, and we sort of just went up and did it, and then I got to the other side, and I came down, and I landed, and Patrick looked at and Patrick Summers looked at me. He said, "How did you do that?" I said, "I don't know." <laughs> We're just not gonna just let's just keep doing it. So. Um, I always think it's funny that right before we, we land, before I mean before I start up into the air, part of the technique of flying is there are all these people that you know are there to support me, make sure that I get ready to go. And so they start. They say, "Are you ready?" And I thought, what would happen if I just said no? <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it's it's a lot of fun. Again, it's another challenge that I, I love, and it was. Um, remarkably easier than I thought it would be this afternoon when I got back in, it was like riding a bike. There you mm -hmm. go. So it's a, Great. yeah. Well, there are a couple of, excuse me, there are, there are a, couple of, a couple of us that are wearing harnesses. And you know, when she says you're sitting on an X, imagine two seat belts that are crossed and you're sitting on the seat belts. That's basically what the harness feels like. So when she's trying to grab support while she's singing, imagine two seat belts. Yeah. And that's what you're, that's the only thing that's holding you up 30 feet in the air as you're singing. So that's something that, well, we're learning as we go. <laughs> ben, you have your own challenge in that oh. Captain Ahab famously has uh, a peg leg. Um, tell us about the experience of singing on one foot, essentially. I kind of wish I had seat belts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it, it's, it's, you know, very, it's very straightforward exactly what happens. But uh, the singing of uh, the singing of the role while also moving about the stage, because the the inner your inner strength has to be the one to move you about. And I have a cane, and then a, a good leg, and then my left leg is the one with the peg on, and so I move about. But of course, you're kind of you have a your interior is kind of going mm, 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 for each step, and now you have to sing. You have to sing. <laughs> And I'm hoping it doesn't sound like, uh, uh. <laughs> and so then you know, have to remember when you do stop. And, and Lenny's been really great about just, at the, you know, the big important move is really very little moving and singing at the same time um, to be able to, just, to release that pressure of the move and just get back to the singing mechanism, the support that that takes. Um, I was a little worried. I was kind of hoping when that when I said yes to this that it would be like a CGI version or something, <laughs> yeah. you know, be kind of a green screen leg or something. <laughs> but uh, no, I actually have to wear a peg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Morgan, having uh, been in the show in Dallas, were you in, in it in Adelaide as well? No, this is my second time. But then you're doing it again in, in San Francisco. San Francisco, yeah. yeah. Um, Yes. Between having done it in Dallas and doing it here, do you notice differences in the show, in movement, for instance, or in the way that Lenny is is is, you know, working with you guys as an ensemble? Are there um, significant differences or small differences that make it more exciting for you, or that engage you a little bit more this time around? Well, uh, like Talise said, I think for, for many of us who, who were in the premiere, there are certain aspects of it that are like riding a bike, but there are um, many additions, many uh, embellishments, also simplifications in terms of blocking, in terms of m uh, movement, in terms of understanding relationships, um, which, uh, as many of you I'm sure know, in, in art, often simple is better. Simpler is better. Um, for me, it's 
vocally, it's interesting. Um, I find myself, um, you know, with new music, there are certain tricks. Um, you know, when you haven't heard a recording over and over again, you know, you're doing Bohem, chances are you've, for the first time, chances are you've heard uh, five or six recordings beforehand. With this, we all, we all have our own way of learning the music, and I'm finding from a musical perspective as well that I'm understanding it a little bit, a little bit differently this time, maybe even getting a little deeper into it. Um, but I, I, in many ways, this, this approach this time around feels, feels more secure, feels deeper, I would say. Um, makes, makes even more sense. Um, and, in, and in some ways is, is just as or even more, more exciting to, to be seeing the material, feeling the material, being and, and inhabiting the material again this time around. Then Lenny, having done it three times, what are you seeing new in the, in the piece as you, as, as, as you do each production? As the, well, is it growing about, for you? Yeah, well, speak about the singers for uh, a moment. It's, it's rare that you get to work with the same singers in the same roles. You know, a lot, and right now it's the entire original cast, with the exception of Jonathan. And in San Francisco, it'll be the entire original cast. It, um, I think, there's less uncertainty, maybe, maybe the second time going in, in terms of what the whole experience is going to be. I mean, in the first time through, from my point of view, I'm still trying to, you know, figure it out. You know, I, I, I probably don't plan. And I plan a lot in advance, but I also change a lot as I go along. And w they were all very patient with me the first time as I restaged you know, things many, many, many times. And they were building the set on the stage in Dallas. And unlike most operas, you know, the set design was not done a year, year and a half in advance. It's, we turned in the design four months before before, and they didn't actually approve it until three months before. That's a tight schedule. And they finished building it on the stage. <laughs> um, and it, but it, I, was, I was allowed in that process um, a very rare three and a half weeks on stage in order to, to create it. Um, but in terms of the singers, what I noticed going in is in terms of you know, l less uncertainty is it's, it's familiar ground, and, and Morgan used the word deeper, and I do see everybody going to a, a deeper place where they're sort of living in the characters and now can explore other options still within the parameters of how they, they, they created them originally. But then, you know, there's one scene in particular, I think, you know, we were working on the other day with, with Talise that we're doing, I think, very differently oh, yeah. than we yeah. did in the, in, the, um, in the premiere. It's all within the parameter of the character and the situation with, with the two of you. And so you, you feel that kind of leeway. You know, I've, I've done a, a number of, you know, plays that have, you know, had long runs in New York, and you have different actors come in. And so I'm used to changing, mm. you know, because you have to adapt to different actors. So I'm used to that, and I enjoy that. And, but the, the best part is when you revisit something with the same people, because you, you, you go deeper. And also, for all of these singers, inclu including myself, at the premiere, you know, none of us had heard the orchestration until the orchestra reads. So I was running around having to change staging and realizing, oh my God, this timpani there, who knew, you know? Um, you know, you know what's happening, you know, this is, you know. Or it's tambourine. A, in the room, you know, it, it, on the piano, it's all very percussive. And luckily, I always had Jake in my ear who was always saying to me, you know, at this moment, what you're hearing is not what you're gonna hear. It's gonna be, it's gonna be this, it's gonna be that. And, and one, one, one particular place is, um, I, I remember, and it's, oh, I switched something around while you have a new entrance, uh, or no, I mean, it's the same entrance as, as in Dallas, but one particular place, I, I, we had given Morgan a particular entrance, and Jake said, if you wait one more bar, he's gonna enter on his theme. How, how would I know that? <laughs> I don't read music, so how do I know that? Um, but also, I didn't know that that was on one layer of the score, but you have a living composer there tell, telling you. Um, what I've done differently since Dallas has changed some of the visuals, not a lot of them, but, but I've, I've changed some of them, things that, you, um, that I didn't have, you know, in, uh, in retrospect, you see it up there and you have the opportunity to change and, you know, you, you don't get any previews in the opera, you just, you know, it's, you just shot out of a cannon and, um, <laughs> and you, do, you just like load them up it works. and shoot yeah. them out and, and hopefully, you know, people are there. So luckily with this thing having, having five co-producers and, and you know, we're, 
wonderful that San Diego was one of the companies that came in right from the beginning, so it was a, a guaranteed five-city tour. And so, um, you know, uh, you know we, I knew I had the opportunity to keep in improving upon things. Um, and I think, I, I think I'm finished. <laughs> a five city tour. Yeah, a five city tour. And there are more already lining up, which is wonderful. Karen, um, just a, a, a question about the orchestration. There's a, you, you mentioned this at one time um, in, in one of your public talks about Moby Dick, uh, the way the, the whale's sounding is dealt with in the orchestration. I think it'd be kind of interesting for the audience to know oh, about yes. that. It's a, something cool to listen for. There are two places did four bars, two bars, where, where the, the whale breaches and we hear him. And what happens is that the, tr the trumpets uh, blow through, they take off their mouthpieces and blow through the trumpet. And he, uh, Jake was talking to me about it. it's notated as a simple eighth or quarter note, but of course it has to be extended. So we, when we got to that place yesterday, they very properly just did <laughs> but it, the minute you say you must sound like a whale, they luxuriated in that, and, and they're now enjoying it quite a bit. But it is. It's a wonderful effect, and instrumentalists love, uh, to an extent, certainly, but love being able to do different things with their instruments, and certainly this informed their imaginations. I try to tell a bit of what's happening as we, as we rehearse it, because I also think that makes a huge difference. This, this business of, a, of an orchestra coming in and playing opera and having no clue what they're playing or why, I think um, is, is cheating both in the pit and the stage. The minute people start to feel that we are aligned with the story is part of what will help this phenomenal orchestration keep its continuum moving. Let's take some questions from the audience. Does anybody have any questions of, uh, of our panel? No one's asked about the whale, which I think is fascinating. <laughs> but you don't ask about the whale. <laughs> I'd like to ask Captain Ahab how he handles the pig. I, I, I mean, do you have your real leg going back, or how do you do this? Well, we, we don't want you to know, do we? <laughs> <laughs> It's supposed to be a mystery. It's, it's a suspension of disbelief on your part. <laughs> Shall we say, you know, I don't, I don't do one of those yoga moves, you know, the, where it, it stuffs up into the, um, uh, you know, the nether regions of my butt or something. Um, that ship has sailed. <laughs> So it's, it's actually very comfortable. Uh, it just, it's a little bit awkward for balance and things. And by the good leg, the one that doesn't have a peg on, it works so hard. And it gets very, very tense over the course of the evening. It probably would be less if it didn't have so much work to do, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Other questions? We have costuming comes into play here. <laughs> I'm wondering how much Jake Hagee has been involved in um, the process of putting this on stage and working with singers or the, or the musicians or anything. Uh, initially, he, he was involved in every moment, every moment. Worked with singers privately, didn't, didn't he? Worked with, you know, worked, he was at every single moment of every rehearsal um, once we got into production, and of course, yeah. And also was, was there, there at all the original orchestra reads. Basically every second, you know. He's the, you know, the. It's an opera. The composer is God. You know, I mean, we 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 take all our literally all our cues from him, and um, everything we do, and hopefully everything the singers do, everything I do is inspired by that. Something I find kind of refreshing is the fact that we're calling it an opera by Jake Heggie and Gene Shear, mm. and you know, in 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 the world of opera, that's not usual. Uh, we're used. To, we, we don't. We don't. Call it Otello by Verdi and Boito, we, or Camarano, or whoever else that he worked with, or, or Puccini and all his many, many librettists. Um, so th that's a kind of a refreshing change, I think, that we're focusing also on the poet who had so much to do with the creation of this piece. Well, it's important. I know it's very important to Jake. You know, yeah. I mean, he 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 has said, you know, he can't write until he's inspired by the words. 
and things go back and forth a lot. And so that, that says a lot, that the, the, the music didn't happen unless there was inspiration from what Gene created. And I mean, it is theater, and, and, you know, and, and Jake is a man of the theater, and he's all about telling the story. And, and it's, it's a beautiful libretto. And you know, it, it starts with characters, and it starts with words, and, and music is part of it. The whole idea of distilling Moby Dick and all its 900 pages down to 2,500 words is astounding to me, and Gene did a magnificent job. What special challenges did it pose for you as a director, the decision that the whole thing was not only to be set at sea, but basically to be in a boat compared to not having, I mean, to, compared to an opera with your normal changes of scenery and staging and things like that? Well, the, the biggest challenge is um, it, it all kind of came down to it all came down to one moment, which was the whale hunt, and, and a lot of the decisions of how to present the opera were based on that. And there were initial decisions. One of the first discussions was that we weren't going to actually see the whale hunt, because Jake and Jean said to me, "How how would we possibly, you know, do a whale hunt?" And I said. And, you know, th there were initial discussions about possibly it would be the men on the ship talking about what they've seen. And I said, it's Moby Dick. We have to hunt the whale. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I got myself backed in a little bit of a corner. I mean, when I work with authors, I always say this. Don't worry about how it's going to be staged. I'll figure that out later. Just, just write what you have to write. And I told them to write it as if it was a movie. I said, just write it as if it's a movie. You know, Jake would say to me, did you think you're going to need time for such and such? And I said, I have no idea how I'm going to do it. So don't, don't, don't just write in the flow that you feel. And so he sunk the Pequod in nine measures. <laughs> and, and so when he sunk the Pequod in nine measures, I knew there wasn't going to be a realistic boat on that stage. And, and it, we, we went through probably three full designs that were scrapped before we came up with this. This is sort of, we, we culled the best pe pieces of this. But once I figured out how we were gonna do, how we were gonna hunt the whales, then, then I went back to the beginning and I figured out how to do the rest of it. Well, I, um, I wanna thank all of you for coming and this terrific panel. I, I think you're feeling a palpable sense of excitement up here and I hope it's growing and that you talk all your friends and family into coming to this terrific experience. It's, uh, I think, going to be the musical and theatrical experience of the year, certainly, and something we're going to remember for a long, long time. So thank you, lady and gentlemen. We appreciate your being here, and we look forward to Moby Dick. Ladies.